right, we are going to go ahead and get started here. Um, this is going to be audio lecture on chapter 33, activity and exercise. All right. All right, so when we're thinking about these following concepts, which are covered in this chapter, we're thinking about mobility. Um, very simply, this is body movement, is mobility, okay? We're thinking about fitness, which is um, the ability to carry out activities of daily living with vigor and alertness without undue fatigue and with enough energy for a response to emergencies if needed, okay? We're talking about physical activity. So this is body movement produced by the contraction of skeletal muscle that increases energy expenditure above a baseline level. And then exercise, this is a subconcept of physical activity. Um, it's planned, it's structured, it's repetitive, and it's purposeful for improving or maintaining physical fitness, performance, and health. Okay. Um, so the physiology of movement. So you can find this information on page 1181. So activity and exercise require body movement or mobility. Mobility depends on the successful interaction among skeletal muscle, uh, the skeleton, the skeletal muscles, and the nervous system. So the skeletal system, which consists of bones, joints, and cartilage, ligaments, and tendons, and then the muscles, and then the motor nervous system as well. Um, body mechanics, um, this is a term used to determine um, to describe the way that we move our body. So it includes four components. So body alignment, um, which is your posture. So good posture contributes to normal functioning and normal well-being. Um, another contributing factor there is coordination. So with that is coordination between the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system is necessary. And then joint mobility. So this allows the body to sit, to stand, bend, walk. Range of motion is the maximum movement possible at a joint. Okay, so when you're thinking range of motion, and that is a skill that you guys will learn in lab as well, you are literally thinking about taking a joint, so all of your joints, anywhere that your, your arms or your legs or your body is able to turn side to side or turn in a circle or bend, you taking that extremity or that area and moving it all around in every possible way that it can possibly go, that is you providing range of motion. So that process can be active or passive, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. So the principles of body mechanics. So um, check out clinical insight in your book, number 33-1, starting on page 1213. You have an entire career in front of you, and you are a valuable, valuable resource to your community and to your facility. So you need to take care of your back and yourself. No one else will do it for you. OK, um, so remember that body mechanics involve good body alignment. So erect posture with wi a wide base of support. And you need to know how to do this appropriately because nursing is a lot of lifting and it can be very hard on your body. So to prevent a back injury, um, you want to make sure that you are carrying objects as close to the close to your body as as possible, not holding them all the way out in front of your body. Do not bend over and lift. Instead, squat down and lift. So don't bend at the waist, bend at the knees. Never, ever, ever bend from the waist and twist. Always stand in front of what you're lifting. Squat down, use your leg muscles instead of your back muscles when you're picking up. Make sure you have a wide base of support. So that means keeping your legs kind of apart instead of right together, okay? Make sure you raise the beds to the appropriate height. Make sure you're pushing versus actually lifting and get help when necessary. People are heavy to lift. So make sure that you call for assistance if you need. So to maintain proper posture, it's important to A, sleep on the softest mattress, mattress possible. B, avoid arching shoulders forward when sitting. C, keep your knees locked when standing upright. Or D, keep your stomach muscles relaxed to prevent back spasms. The answer is B, arching shoulders forward when you're sitting alters the curvature of your spine and contributes to poor body alignment. So that's poor posture. We all know what poor posture looks like. 
So talking about joint mobility, so you guys can find this on page 1183. So joint mobility is necessary for all activities involving movement, okay? It's just is. So active range of motion, this is the maximum movement possible at the joint, okay? You can see in this picture how this person is doing a range of motion activity on another patient taking his leg, moving it up in the bent position, but also straightening it out and moving it up again. And then you could move it outwards. Those are all the ways that your leg is supposed to be able to move. And that would be providing range of motion, okay? So AROM, A-R-O-M, active range of motion. This is when the client is able to move their own joints without assistance. So in this picture, you can see a nurse is performing that task for this person. So that is PROM or passive range of motion. So that is when the nurse moved the joint, moves the joints through their range of motion when the client is unable to do so themselves. Okay. Each you, each of us, you and I can do our own range of motion. That would be active range of motion. So the point of this, it prevents joint contractures. So if anybody's ever seen a contracture at the nursing home with an elderly person where maybe their hands get literally stuck into a certain position. Um, that's what happens when you don't, you don't use it, you lose it, you, it gets stuck like that. And so range of motion will help prevent that. However, um, it, it's very painful to continue to do range of motion when they get like that. So be aware of that and maybe medicate for pain before we do that for with somebody who already has a contracture. So why else are we doing range of motion? So it increases joint mobility. Um, for example, stroke patients are taught um, passive range of motion exercises for their affected side. So a lot of times with the stroke, they'll have one side of their body that they can't use anymore. Um, and so for that side, they're taught these passive range of motion where they will use their good arm um, to help with the other side, okay? Um, so there's lots of different types of exercise as noted here, you guys can read a little bit more about in your book, but I'll give you a brief rundown on kind of what these are. So isometric exercise. So that can be seen in this top picture here. Um, it involves muscle contraction without motion. Okay. So these exercises are usually performed against an immovable surface or object. For example, pressing the hand against a wall. Um, each position is held for six to eight seconds, repeated five to 10 times. This type of training is effective for developing total strength of a muscle group. It requires no special equipment and there's little chance of injury. Patients who are bed bound can use isometric, isometric exercise to maintain or regain muscle strength. Moving down below there, you'll see isotonic exercise. So this involves movement of the joint during the muscle contraction. A classic example of isotonic exercise is weight training with three weights. So as the weight is moved throughout the range of motion, the muscle shortens and lengthens, okay? Um, Push-ups, pull-ups, planks, all of these use body weight as the resistance force. So those are, those are also isotonic exercises, but weight exercises are as well. Next, you'll see isokinetic exercise. So this is performed with specialized apparatuses that provide variable resistance to movement. So this type of exercise combines um, the best features of both isometric and weight training by providing resistance at a constant speed while the muscle moves through the full range of motion. Machines at health clubs are a good example of this. Next, there's aerobic exercise. So this occurs when the amount of oxygen taken into the body meets or exceeds the amount of oxygen required to perform the activity. So aerobic exercise uses very large muscle groups and can be maintained continuously and is rhythmic in nature. It increases the heart and respiratory rate and provides exercise for the cardiovascular system while also exercising the skeletal muscles. So jogging, brisk walking, cycling, these are common forms of aerobic exercise. And then there's anaerobic exercise. So this occurs when the amount of oxygen taking into the body does not meet the amount of oxygen required to perform the activity. So therefore, the muscles must obtain energy from metabolic pathways that do not use oxygen. So this is rapid, intense exercises such as lifting heavy objects and sprinting. Um, those are both examples of anaerobic exercise. Anaerobic means without oxygen, aerobic means with oxygen. 
So the benefits of exercise. So basically exercise produces exceptional benefits to all of these systems, okay? It improves cardiovascular health. It increases muscle tone and flexibility. It enhances the immune system. It promotes weight loss and it decreases stress and increases an overall feeling of well-being, okay? Um, so when we're talking about self-care and teaching older adults about activity and exercise, we want to let them know that we recommend they get at least 30 minutes of endurance activity almost every day. Exercise that makes you breathe hard, build strength, and staying power. We want them to incorporate resistance into their exercise. So resistance training with weights or isometric activity to build strength is good. Um, we want to say, remember that you can do more and are less likely to fall when your muscles are strong. Do things that work on your balance, such as standing on one foot. This can help prevent falls as well. Daily stretching will be helpful. And then almost anyone can do some type of physical activity. But before starting any type of new exercise program, I want to encourage them to talk to their healthcare provider, especially if they experience any of the following. So a change in your health in the past six months, any shortness of breath, dizziness, chest pain or pressure, a fluttering heart, things like that. Um, so talk about exercise programs. So you can check out the Department of Health um, Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans on page 1191, box 33-2. A well-rounded fitness program focuses on flexibility training, resistance training, and aerobic conditioning. So the mode of exercise is the type of activity. So aerobic is endurance and muscle strengthening is resistance and physical activities promote better health. So in flexibility training, stretching before exercise helps warm up the muscles and prevents injury during exercising. Stretching after exercising cools the muscles and limits post-exercise stiffness. In resistance training, movement against resistance increases muscular strength and endurance. Perhaps the most common types of resistance training is weightlifting. So you can exercise for strength by increasing the amount of resistance or weight with each exercise, so lift more weight, or you can exercise for endurance. So this increases the number of repetitions. So how many times are you going to lift that weight? And that'll give you more endurance. And then aerobic conditioning. So fitness and body composition are improved by aerobic conditioning. Components of aerobic conditioning include intensity, duration, frequency, and mode. Okay, intensity is how hard one is exercising. So aerobic conditioning is very great for cardiovascular health. So the benefits and risks of exercise. So benefits, regular exercise or other physical activity produce long-term health benefits, including a lower risk for early death, lower risk for heart disease and stroke, and for type two diabetes, lower risk for hypertension, lower risk for hyperlipidemia, which is high um, cholesterol in the blood, lower risk for colon and breast cancers, and for depression. People with disabilities also benefit from physical activity, for older, for older adults, walking is a great form of exercise and the risk of injury to joints is lower than other physical activities. So brisk walking for as little as 30 minutes a day when done consistently promotes weight loss and maintenance of normal weight, lowers the risk and disability, the risk of disability, reduces the loss of bone density and promotes better heart and lung function. So that's a very important to teach our patient. Um, moderate intensity walking is even better than that. Um, the risks, which we can list, would include um, cardiac injury. So fear of triggering, triggering a cardiac event deters some people from exercising. However, physical activity is rarely life-threatening, especially when compared to the health risk associated with a sedentary lifestyle. So we need to educate our patients on that. Um, High impact exercises may pose a risk for injury to bones, joints, and muscles. However, you can prevent most injuries by assuring that you have proper body alignment and form. That's important. Um, dehydration, fluid and electrolyte loss occurs with prolonged exercise. High ambient temperature, certain medications and underlying health problems can all contribute to that. So keep in mind that water is the best choice during and after most exercise. Some sports drinks contain glucose and electrolyte replacement for activities that are vigorous. 
Um, and then temperature regulation, hyperthermia, which is a high body temperature can occur when a person exercises in a hot climate. So this is often accompanied by dehydration. So they need to be aware of that. Um, same with heat exhaustion. This is a potentially life-threatening event. Um, signs of heat exhaustion include lightheadedness, nausea, headache, fatigue, hyperventilation, loss of concentration, abdominal cramps, and cold, clammy skin. Hypothermia, which is low body temperature, can also occur when a person does not wear proper clothing or is exposed to cold water for an extended period of time. Um, signs and symptoms of hypothermia include fatigue, confusion, and lack of coordination. So what factors are affecting our mobility and activity? So um, developmental stage, right? So you can see the self-care teaching box on page 1193, and that will kind of go through that. But obviously, developmental stage, older adults are not going to be able to do as much as, a reg as like a middle-aged adult, and the same with younger children, okay? Um, nutrition. So obesity leads to chronic health problems, which further reduces activity and contributes to further obesity. Some chronic diseases can lead to issues with muscle wasting and fatigue as well. Um, lifestyle um, options. So personal values about exercise and fitness. Some people enjoy it and others absolutely do not. There are also cultural beliefs in, that influence exercise. So uh, what kind of swimsuits can be worn, exercising with with or around males. Um, there are def definitely things to consider in that, that realm. Um, environmental factors as well. So the weather, um, pollution, neighborhood crime, are you scared to go running by yourself? Finances, support systems, things like that. So musculoskeletal system disorders that all may affect our mobility and or exercise. So congenital um, anomalies of the musculoskeletal system that affect appearance, motor function, and or mobility. So we're talking about things like hip dysplasia, scoliosis, club foot. You can definitely review all of these in your book on page 1193, okay? Definitely look into those. Um, diseases related to bone formation or metabolism, these can be congenital, which means they're born with them, or due to dietary deficiencies, okay? Um, like dwarfism, Paget's disease, vitamin D and calcium deficiencies, which is um, called rickets. Those can contribute as well. Um, diseases affecting joint mobility can be due to degeneration or inflammatory processes, such as osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis and gout. So you'll need to look at all of these as well on page 1194. Um, problems affecting bone integrity. So these can re result in a loss of integrity and can be caused by bone production issues, infections, and tumors. So for instance, osteoporosis, osteomyelitis, and bone tumors. Okay, for example, osteoporosis, which is a decrease in total bone density. After age 30, bone loss begins and women start to experience a rapid decline in bone mass at menopause. This can increase the risk of fracture with even normal activities. So performing weight-bearing exercises is very helpful for these patients. A sedentary lifestyle increases the risk, okay? Trauma can affect bones and ligaments and joints. So fractures, sprains, um, strains, ta uh, tearing injuries, and things like that. Um, and then disorders of the central nervous system. So a disorder that would affect motor sensors um, of the brain and nerves to control mobility, such as a stroke or spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis. And don't forget how other systems like the respiratory and circulatory system might also affect exercise. Again, all of this on page 1194 to 1195 that you need to review. Uh, immobility consideration. So Immobility, your patient cannot move like they should. That's a problem. So why is that a problem? So it can cause a loss of muscle strength. It can cause atrophy, which means the breaking down of the muscle. It can cause stiff joints. It can cause contractures, which we talked about, where their muscles and their hands or feet or whatever gets literally stuck. Um, pneumonia, so it decreases lung expansion. So it can cause pneumonia from immobility. That's a huge concern. That's a huge concern. 
especially in the hospital after surgery, if anybody's ever seen people use that incentive spirometer where you have to take a big deep breath in, that's to exercise your lungs while you can't get up. Immobility puts you at risk for tons of stuff. So pneumonia, that's a big thing. No movement equals the blood pooling and not flowing, which puts you at a risk for a blood clot. So DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, okay? That means a blood clot. So no movement puts you at an extreme risk for a blood clot. Um, also puts you, no movement puts you at risk for constipation. In order to have healthy bowel movements, we need to be able to move. That's what moves it all along in there. Um, orthostatic hypotension. So what that means is that when you are moving positions, your blood pressure drops, you get very dizzy, you might pass out. That can be a risk with immobility. Um, pressure injuries. So protecting immobile patients' skin integrity is super important. So that's when we get back to our, um, our intervention of turning our patient every two hours to promote blood flow to the skin, right? Also providing passive range of motion for people who can't control their limbs themselves, like quadriplegics. Prevent, it prevents contractions and promotes that joint mobility. Um, providing active range of motion or reminding patients to provide their own active range of motions for those who can, and make sure that your patient does as much as they can on their own to promote their independence and their function. If you don't use it, you lose it. You know, I've said that a million times, I feel like. So now we're gonna move into our nursing process with activity and exercise. So with our assessment, we always start with our assessment, right? So we need to focus nursing history. So we need to focus on the activity and exercise addressing what's their normal activity, what's their fitness goals, what's their mobility problems, do they have any underlying health problems, what's their lifestyle factors. And then we do a focused physical assessment. So important data to include would be um, vital signs, a heightened weight, a body mass index, um, maybe their body alignment, their joint function, what do they look like when they walk, their gait, which means their walk. Um, muscle strength, their activity tolerance, or do they get short of breath when they walk down the hallway, that kind of thing. Um, nursing diagnoses that specifically describe act activity and exercise problems include um, activity intolerance. So this is a state in which a patient has insufficient physical or psychological energy to carry out daily activities, okay? Impaired physical mobility, so that would be a limitation of independent and purposeful movement of the body. Risk for disuse syndrome. This is when a patient's prescribed or unavoidable activity creates the risk for deterioration of other body systems. And then sedentary lifestyle, which is just a habit of life that has a low physical activity level. And then planning our outcomes and evaluation. As we know, these get to be um, more, you, you make these more specific based on your patient's um, lifestyle value and presentation. So individualized goals and outcome statements depend on the nursing diagnosis that you choose, but because activity and exercise abilities are individualized, goals must consider the patient's current condition, expected condition changes, lifestyle, and values. So for example, patient will independently transfer to a wheelchair by whatever date, patient will discuss his feelings about activity restrictions by whatever date, okay? That's how you get it specific. Remember your your um, goal statements need to be smart, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timed. So there must be a target date in there. Test your knowledge. So of the following interventions for a client who is immobile, the nurse will give priority to A, encouraging a diet high in fiber and extra fluids, B, administering the PRN or as needed medication for sleep, C, having the client use the incentive spirometer every two hours, or D, massaging the client's legs every hour. Okay, so this is another great example of an NCLEX style question. So if you read through these, um, I'm saying that obviously we have an immobile client and we know from what we just talked about that encouraging a diet high in fiber and extra fluids, that would be a great option because that would treat constipation. We know immobility um, can cause constipation, right? So there's an option. B, administering PRN medication for sleep. I wouldn't think that that would even be in contender. 
Um, letter C, so having the client use the incentive spirometer every two hours. Hmm. So we know that being immobile for a long period of time can cause decreased lung expansion, which can mess with breathing, cause pneumonia, things like that. So I think that's a contender. And then D, massaging the client's legs every hour. So massaging the legs every hour, that could prevent, that, that would promote circulation, right? Promote blood flow to the legs. And that could be a great option to prevent a DVT or a blood clot. So I think that's a contender, right? So when we're stuck between these three, these three questions or these three answers, and we're trying to decide which one's the most appropriate one, I want you to always go back to the airway. Nothing will ever be more important than the airway. So after you narrow it down, I want you to find, okay, there's three right answers. Okay, maybe there is, but this question is asking for a priority and the priority is always your airway. So that makes the correct answer C because this addresses the airway, okay? The use of the incentive spirometer helps to prevent atelectasis, which improves oxygenation and that is a priority need. All right. So promoting exercise in clients. Okay, so we're gonna plan and vary an exercise routine. We want to find an exercise routine that is going to be uh, doable for our patient. What do they like? What do they not like? What can we recommend? What's the best time of day? How can we fit it into their schedule and make it realistic for them? Using the buddy system and rewards, maybe encourage them to find an exercise partner, maybe encourage them to set a goal and provide themselves an, an award when they reach their goal. Teach them how to integrate exercise into routine activities, maybe parking their car super far away from um, the door when they go to work or taking the stairs instead of the elevator. And then attain a target heart rate. Typically you're getting in that heart rate zone when your heart rate's about like 150 to 170. And remember that nurses are examples to our patients. So what kind of an example are you giving when it comes to activity and exercise? So um, also positioning patients. So as you can see our lovely picture here, never been at the waist, always been at the knees, right? So when positioning patients, we wanna consider that as well. So make sure that our patient is in proper alignment in the hospital bed. Make sure that they're using range of motion we're incorporating pillows, wedges, those to position our patient off their bottoms maybe, or off a sore spot. Um, make sure that we're using their side rails as needed. The overhead trapeze is great for patients who have had back surgery. Um, using a footboard if needed, different kinds of things, which you guys can read about all of these interventions in your book. Um, just make sure that you as the nurse save your back, okay? Call for help. Um, when we talk about positioning patients, here's a great picture. There are all kinds of different positions for our patients that we need to know, okay? And your NCLEX style questions throughout this program will use this terminology. So you need to have this memorized, okay? I'm not gonna promise you there's an exact test question about it on your coming exam, but I can guarantee you there will be test questions about these positions on your exams and you will need to know in order to answer the question. So um, you can see prone position here. You can see prone position here is them lying on their stomach. You can see that supine position here is them lying flat on their back in neutral, in neutral spine. So this is also called dorsal recumbent. It can be called that as well. So prone is on the belly, supine is on their back. Um, right lateral recumbent, that just means that they're laying on their right side. Left lateral recumbent means they're laying on their left side. Fowler's, so a note on Fowler's position. So Fowler's is typically with the head and torso raised 45 to 60 degrees, okay? There's not a picture on here of semi-Fowler's. However, um, semi-Fowler's is a step below Fowler's with the head raised to 15 to 45 degrees. Okay, so a little bit lower than that. So Fowler's and semi-Fowler's. Fowler's is a great position to put in, uh, put your patient in when they cannot breathe very well because sitting up straight, you can breathe much better. Okay, so that's Fowler's position. Lateral is just sideline, okay? Prone on their belly, like we talked about. Sims, which there's not a picture of, but I'm gonna tell you. Sims is when they're on a, in a semi-prone position. So they're positioned where their lower arm is positioned behind the patient and their upper arm is flexed, 
okay? Supine, flat on the back. And FYI, like I told you, anybody who is severely obese um, or people who are short of breath can rarely tolerate anything other than semi-fowlers or fowlers position due to lung disease and things of the sort. So moving a patient up in bed. So um, frail patients like to slide down in the bed because gravity and their inability to correct their own position. So elevating the head of the bed assinuates the slide and places the patient in an awkward position. So if the patient is light in weight or able to assist, you'll be able to move her independently. However, you may need help. Whereas one of you, one of you and, and your coworkers, each of you on each side of the bed, and you will pull them up with a bed pad. And we'll go over that in lab. When turning a patient in bed, it's the most important intervention to protect the patient's skin and to prevent other complications from immobility. So for efficient use of time, try to time turning to coincide with moving the patient up in bed. Okay, so do them both at the same time. Pillows and other positioning devices can help the patient maintain that new position. Log rolling, this is a special turning technique used when the patient's supine and must be kept in a straight body alignment. This moves the patient's whole body as a unit, okay? And this is usually for patients who've had some kind of back surgery. Um, if you see page 1208, moving a patient out of bed, transferring a patient with the gait belt, um, you can review that, that in, on that area, okay? Um, there are mechanical lifts as well um, that are used for patients who are not safe to transfer any other way. All right, so talking about assisting with ambulation. So remember, ambulation just means walking or moving, okay? So this may require conditioning exercises, which you can review in your book that involve um, dangling, arm exercises, quadricep and gluteal drills. You can read all about those in your book. Um, but we wanna make sure that when we are assisting with ambulation, we obtain the appropriate assistive devices. So this includes canes. Um, walkers, braces, and crutches. So with canes, um, canes are ideal for a patient who needs minimal support and can negotiate stairs. Okay. So they're going to hold the cane on the stronger side of their body, not on the weaker side. They're going to distribute weight evenly between the feet and the cane. They're going to advance the cane and the, and the weaker leg at the same time. Then they're going to bring the stronger leg through. Okay, they're gonna avoid leaning over on the cane. They're gonna maintain the rubber tip integrity for traction. And that's how they're gonna use a cane. Um, for walkers, they're going to, walkers are great because they provide a wide base of support for ambulation. So they're gonna stand between the back legs of the walker, not too far behind. They're gonna pick up the walker and advance it just as they step ahead. And that's how they're gonna do that. Um, you can see how to ambulate with crutches on page 1216 to 1218. There's multiple different kinds of gates that you can work with on crutches. So tripod position, you can do the four point gate, the three point gate, the swing through gate, all of these. And you can see a lot of these on page 1217. Um, I want you to review those. Um, you will be going over them in lab. You'll have a group project about that. So. Um, you'll get familiar with that in labs, but you do need to, to read about that because there may be some questions on your exam about that as well. Um, and FYI, if you're ambulating your patient and they begin to fall, you need to first yell for help. And then as your client is falling, you need to protect their head as they go down. You need to guide their body down to the ground and just wait for assistance to get them back up. Don't ever try to stop your patient from falling. It won't work. Just guide them, lower them safely to the ground, and that's the best you can do. Test your knowledge. So identify the true statement about devices used when assisting clients to ambulate. A, the client should stand with a foot back, stand a foot back from the back legs of the walker. B, a cane should be used by the client to support the weakest side of the body. C, a transfer belt should be placed around the client's chest for maximum lift. Or D, each crushed walking gait begins with the client in the tripod position. 
The correct answer is D. The tripod position is the basic crutch standing position from which the client moves forward. So you can check out Clinical Insight 33-6 on pages 1216 to 1217, and that will kind of let you know that. Now, if you hold on. Nope, we did that. Okay, so that concludes this lecture for activity and exercise.